My name is Larry Conway. I'm an interviewer affiliated with Tempe Connections in Tempe, Arizona, an official Veterans History Project partner. The veteran I'm interviewing today, May 3rd, 2011, is Charles Lombardi, who prefers to go by the name of Charlie. Charlie currently lives in Chandler, Arizona. He was born in New York City, New York, on June 18th, 1924. Charlie enlisted in the U.S. Army in 1943 and left the Army in 1946. Charlie's service to his country occurred during World War II. Thank you, Charlie, for sharing your wartime experiences. And uh, let's get started, shall we? Can you tell us a little bit about uh, your early years and the transition through uh, your family into high school and then into the service? Well, I, I went to high school in uh, Manhattan, and I learned uh, airplane uh, rigging engines mechanics and uh, more or less uh, to be an aircraft mechanic in a vocational high school. And uh, when I left the, the high school, I went to work for the New York Central Railroad. And uh, we were involved with World War II and I told my dad one day that I thought I should enlist in the Army and uh, get involved in the war. And he was very much against it. So that I did what my father said. And so I didn't enlist. How old were you, Charlie, at the time? I was uh, 18. And uh, when I turned 19, I was talking with some of my local buddies, and they were gathering in a group to go and enlist. And they wanted me to go with them. Uh, but I told them I couldn't enlist. So they said, well, go down to the draft board and uh, find out when you're going to be drafted. And uh, maybe we'll set a date to all go at that time. So I went to the draft board and they looked up my records and said, you won't be drafted for quite a while. But they said, if you want to volunteer to be drafted, you can be drafted next month. So I signed a voluntary draft uh, paper and the next month I was drafted. And I went with about seven other of my friends uh, into the army and um, I was interviewed in the, by an officer, and he asked me what branch of the service I would like to be in. Actually, it was at an induction center and not the Army. And I told him uh, I'd like to become a mechanic in the Air Force. I had just completed a course of four years in high school for aircraft maintenance. And he told me at that time they weren't accepting any new mechanics. But he said, uh, maybe you could become a mechanic in the Army with trucks. So I said, well, that should work. Uh, I thought in the back of my mind that being a truck mechanic would take me off the front lines, give me a job in the Army, but I'd be in the back where it was a little safer. So they gave me three tests. One was a mechanical aptitude, one was an intelligence test, and the other was a uh, a test to see how far I had educated myself. And I passed high on all three, and they sent me to Aberdeen Proving Grounds in Maryland to school for automotive mechanics. At the same time, I took my Army basic training. And when I was done there, I was assigned to the 873rd Replacement Battalion. And in June of 1944, right after D-Day, I boarded a troop ship and landed in, in England. On the way, we had a funny experience. While, we were, while the battalion was on the dock in New York, 
waiting to board the troop ship. One of the fellows in my group had a small dog, and he was determined to take this little dog with him. <laughs> and we were told there were no animals of any kind allowed on this ship. So he put the dog in his duffel bag, and he's carrying it there with his dog in it. <laughs> and when we were on the dock, the dog started to bark. <laughs> well, immediately, all the officers were running around trying to find out where the dog was. Well, immediately, about 350 guys all started barking. So they was barking all over the place, and there was no way they were going to find that dog. And he got the dog on the ship, and the dog later became the company mascot. And we had it with us over in Europe. <laughs> Do you remember the name of the ship that you were in? It was the SS George Washington. It was a uh, passenger ship converted to a troop ship. Caught fire and burned after the war in some port in South America. But during the war, it was a troop ship. It was uh, uh, comfortable for the uh, officers and the women, but we were down in the hole, and uh, uh, once or twice on the way across, we had to get up on deck and put on our life preservers and sit on the, the deck and with one guy in front of you and a guy in front of him, everybody, because German submarines were found getting ready to put torpedoes into us. Mm. So what they did, they put a ship, a cargo ship between us and where the, the submarine was to try to protect us. So we, we uh, were rocked a little bit by the depth charges, but the submarine never fired anything at us. What was it like below decks on the ship? How many tiers of beds did you uh, There's about four, maybe five tiers in some places. And if you lay down and put your knees up, you're booting the guy above you. you know, that's how. That's how much space there was between the, uh, the cots. And it was interesting. We had a storm for a couple of days. When we got on the boat, they gave us a, a uh, dining card. And uh, you, you, you were allowed to go twice to the mess hall and eat. And they punched your card. And uh, so you had to get on a long line if you wanted to eat. But when the storm hit, you can walk right in and eat any time you want. <laughs> because everybody was... Yeah, I did good for a couple of days in the storm. I was, I was good. I was eating it. But then uh, in, in, the, uh, in the areas where we were, a lot of fellows were throwing up. And that, that made me sick after a while. And we landed in in England, and during the, the trip, the uh, fellows on the ship were trying to figure out where we were going, you know, nobody knew. Who we were. At that time, there was heavy fighting going on in, in North Africa, we thought we might be getting sent there. So I thought I'd have some fun, and I told the fellows in my quarters there that I overheard two officers talking and we're going to North Africa. Oh, they were all disappointed. There a lot of swearing going on and saying, geez, we don't want to go to North Africa. So later that afternoon, a couple of guys come over and say, guess what? We find out where we're going. I said, yeah, where? They said, well, one of the guys in Company B overheard two officers this morning, and we're going to North Africa. And I said, holy mackerel. At first, I didn't think it was me. <laughs> and I said, oh, geez, I don't want to go to North Africa. And then I realized it was my rumor. <laughs> we landed in England. When we landed at the dock, the tugs pushed us sideways to the dock. And then everybody was up on the deck looking down. And we almost turned the ship over, but the, the ship started to lean. I went to the far side of the ship, and I could look right down on the dock. That's how steep that. And they they blew the sir sirens and told everybody below decks. The ship almost rolled over in the dock. What port did you land at when you went? Liverpool. 
trained there for uh, uh, for about a month, and then they put us on an English ship, and we landed on Omaha Beach as replacements for uh, people being killed. Do you remember the date you landed at Omaha Beach? I'll have to take a guess at it and say it was August 1st. And uh, I remember climbing up that hill and I was wearing a heavy pack. I had a gun, ammunition, and you could hear the artillery fire. And then and realizing we were in the war, you know. And uh, when I got to where we were going to be headquartered, most of the men in the uh, replacement battalion were uh, infantrymen. So they were being called. Every morning when you stood up on, on the line, they would call names of these men out and they would send them up to the front to replace infantry, infantry men that was killed. Well, I was a mechanic, and there wasn't too, many, too much calls for a mechanic. So I was assigned to the 873rd Army Post Office, which I worked, I worked the post office for a while. I worked my way into the section that had the letter L because I would get my mail faster that way. Huh? And then around the end of November, uh, a uh, representative from the 10th Armored Division came to the replacement battalion uh, to pick up a mechanic. So I was assigned to the 10th Armored Division. And I discovered when I got there that uh, the fellow I was replacing had uh, walked into a minefield even though this field had been cleared by the Army engineers, uh, the only thing they had to mark the mines was a piece of toilet paper on a stick. Mm. So they had these sticks with the toilet paper on it marked on the field where all the mines were, and then it rained. Mm. All the toilet paper was washed away. So now there was no marks on the field. And this fellow had gotten onto the field, don't know why he was out there, but as he was walking, he stepped on one of the anti-personnel mines, and they make a popping noise when you do when you step on them, because they're designed uh, as you step on the mine and then take the next step or two, it pops up out of the ground and blows up in the air. Mm. Well, he felt the pop in the ground. I knew what, what the story was that a mine was about to pop up out of the ground, so he held his foot on it, mm. and. Um, it blew up in the ground and blew off his foot. No one would go on the field because they were afraid of setting off another mine. And what they did was uh, they sent out a frantic call for a, a mine detector. They couldn't locate one. And the sergeant who was afraid of so this fellow went on the field, picked him up, and as he was carrying him off the field, he stepped on another mine and it killed both of them. And I was the replacement of the fellow who stepped on the first mine. So the, the, in the outfit, everyone has a, a, a nickname. Nobody's known by their regular name. They, everybody, his nickname was Hambone, and I was Hambone's replacement. And Hambone was a <laughs> very loved guy in the company. And it was hard for them to accept me as his replacement. Were there other replacements that came in the same time you did, or were you the only replacement at that time? I came in by myself on that trip. And uh, <laughs> actually, when I got to the company, well, like I said, Nobody could replace Hambone, so the sergeant put me in the kitchen. So, here I am, a mechanic, and I'm in the kitchen washing pots. So, I knew that it, the officers 
uh, used to read all our mail uh, and uh, for censorship, you know. So I wrote a letter to my family saying that how disappointed I was to go through all that trouble to become a mechanic in the army only to wind up in the kitchen. And the next morning, the uh, officer coming through the line said, Lombardi, we'll have you in the kitchen, uh, out of the kitchen as soon as we can. Because, he says, but uh, for now, I'd, I'd like you to stay there because we need your help there. So about a week later, one of the other fellows, one of the mechanics who had repaired a Jeep, he was test driving the Jeep and he came around the corner pretty fast, sliding on the ice and smashed into a half track and totally wrecked the Jeep. So he was called into the CEO's office and the company commander said to him, well, you've got two choices. You can pay for the Jeep or you can relieve Lombardi in the kitchen. So that's how I got out of the kitchen. And, um, and then I was with the 10th Armored right to the end of the war. Mm -hmm. Went through um, quite a few traumatic experiences, things that happened only during wartime. I told you about the coming in the front door and at the same time a German officer coming in the back, a German soldier coming in the back door and the two of us staring at each other not knowing what to do. And uh, I had slid my hand into my pocket because I always carried a 25 caliber semi-automatic. And I took the safety off and I waited to see what the German soldier was going to do. If he took his gun and put it around the front, I would have shot him. But he was smart. He kept his gun on his shoulder, turned around, and he went up the stairs to the second floor. And I got the hell out of there as fast as I could. <laughs> can, you, can you tell us what led up to that encounter? Yes. <laughs> we, we were at Metz, and the battle lines were on the outskirts of Metz, and we were right in the center of Metz, because we had already taken the town. And we were kind of like in a, a rest period. And a couple of the guys had gotten some bottles of wine, and we started a party. So we're having this party in the middle of Metz. We could hear the, the shooting and the bombing and the shelling going on, but we were enjoying this party, and uh, we ran out of wine. So one of the fellas in the office said, I know where we can get some wine. And, uh, so I said, well, I got a Jeep. If it ain't too far, we'll go. It was 11 o'clock at night. I said, you think you can get it at 11 o'clock? Yeah, he says, come on. So we jumped in the Jeep and we drove to this, uh, this house in the middle of Metz. I don't know how he knew about this house, but he did. Uh, we knocked on the door and a, an old guy opened the window upstairs and Looked down on us. Uh, what do you want? I said, we want some wine. He said, go home. He said, it's late. Uh, no, no, we want some. We were loaded, and we wouldn't leave without the wine. So he came down with him and his wife, and she, there was no electricity in the house. She's standing there holding a lamp in the hallway, and he went down the stairs to the cellar to get the wine, and that's when the German walked in the back door. <laughs> of course, if he had come in the front, he would have saw our Jeep. Well, for some reason, he came in the back door of the house, and uh, the woman right away, she's yelling, Bosch, Bosch, they call the Germans, Bosch, 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 shoot him, shoot him. I said, hey, we're here for wine, we ain't here to shoot anybody. Hmm. But I thought to myself, I better be careful, just in case he swings his gun around the front, it's going to be a shootout. So, but he didn't, he turned around and went up the stairs, just as nice. Was, was this a hotel? That, uh, uh, no, it was a, like an apartment building. Okay. You know? And uh, it was right in the middle of Metz, how he got there. I have a feeling that he must have known a girl upstairs on the second floor, and he was coming to visit her. 
And uh, this German, uh, the French woman didn't like him. She wanted us to, she wanted us actually to shoot the guy. And I said, hey, if you, if you don't get nasty, we ain't gonna shoot. We're not here for that. Anyway, when we got back to where the party was, everybody had fallen asleep <laughs> the party was over. Uh, Can you tell us a little bit about what your training was and what your duties were as far as mechanic was concerned? Well, I went to school for four months at Aberdeen, also at the same time taking basic training, where it's the same training that all the soldiers get. It, it's a infantry type training. You learn how to march and climb through uh, obstacle courses and uh, learn how to shoot a rifle on the range. And, uh, Get ready because you never know in the service you could be a mechanic one day and then here comes a battle and then next thing you know you're, you're infantry. They tell you you're infantry now. In fact, they did that. Uh, we had one occasion. The first day when I was, my first day in the Battle of Bastogne, we were in France and the sergeant told us we were going to head up towards Bastogne. The Germans were surrounding Bastogne. So he gave us five gallon cans of whitewash with big paintbrushes and told us to paint our vehicles white because there was snow on the ground and it would be camouflage. So we, we painted all our trucks and tanks and stuff white. And then the next morning, oh, they had us take off all our insignia because General Patton didn't want the Germans to know he was moving the 10th Armored Division out of France. He wanted the Germans to think that we were still there. Meanwhile, in, in the middle of the night, we're running up to Bastogne. That's the reason why when you read artic uh, articles about the Battle of Bastogne, you see very little about the 10th Armored Division because a lot of people didn't know we were there. Hmm. We were fighting without identification. Anyway, we got up to just outside of Bastogne after driving all day and all night. And we took over a farmhouse that had been vacated by the people there because it was in a battle zone. And the civilians always get out, of, they leave, you know. So we took over this farmhouse and it was about 11 o'clock at night. We were all slipping into our sleeping bags. We had started a fire in the fireplace to keep warm. The sergeant come in and he said, we just got word that the Germans have a tank column headed this way. And he said, we've been ordered to hold our position. And we said, what the hell's the matter? Are you crazy? We're mechanics. <laughs> you want us to stop tanks? That's what our orders are, not to leave. We hold our position. And he says, I know you're all mechanics, but tonight you're all infantry. So we loaded up our guns. And he took me and another fellow in a Jeep, and he drove us about a half a mile down the road. And they had dug a slit trench. It's a feed trench like that. They put me and another fellow in this trench. And he said, you see the road there? That's where the Germans are going to show up. And when, as soon as you see them start shooting, he gave us a, a bazooka with two cases of shells, machine gun on a tripod. We had our rifles and uh, we had hand grenades. We were really armed. But <laughs> if a column of German tanks ever showed up, then it dawned on me. We were there as an early warning. The, the captain knows if the Germans show up, we're going to get killed. But it makes a lot of noise and it'll warn the company, you know. <laughs> so, mm. so we, uh, I stood there like this. I'll never forget that. And I did this all night because it was so cold. It was the same night my feet were frozen. Even though I was in that trench standing on straw. My feet were frozen that night. And uh, on the right side of the road was a tall hedgerow. 
where you couldn't see in the other, you couldn't see the field on that side. Uh, this side was wide open and they, they had cut the hay and it was in piles on the ground. Everyone looked like a man laying on the ground there, you know. And we stood there shivering in this trench there, looking down the road, waiting for the uh, Germans to show up, you know. And uh, first thing you know, we heard noise on the other side of the hedgerows. And I said to the fellow with me, I said, hey, did you see that? Did you hear that? He said, yeah, shut up. I said, they're coming up the other side of the hedges there. He said, yeah, don't make any noise, you know. So, I remember thinking, I hope they go by and they don't see us. <laughs> Let them go to the company. <laughs> they don't want to send us here. <laughs> so, after a while, through the, an opening in the hedges, a big black dog comes through. <laughs> and he comes right up to the, to the trench where I was, and his eyes were about the same height as mine, because I was not in a hole in the east. <laughs> and he started barking. And he kept barking and barking at my eyes. Holy mackerel, the Germans didn't know we were here. They know now. Mm -hmm. I kept saying to them, why don't you go home? We're, we're busy fighting a war here. We ain't got time for this. <laughs> but uh, he barked, I guess, for about an hour, and he finally got tired and he left. But uh, when they came to pick me up, I couldn't walk. They picked me up and carried me to the Jeep and took me back. And I, my feet were ice cold oh, for about five or six hours. They never warmed up that night. They just were cold. And uh, I still have trouble with my feet to this day from the, you know, they tell me that my feet weren't really frozen because they would have turned black. Mm -hmm. They were frostbitten. But I suffered for five years. Every time it got cold, my feet would hurt something, to, right up to my knees. And uh, I'm pretty much over that now, but uh, I still had times when, uh, if my feet are cold, they hurt. This was in December 1944? That was uh, around, the, yep, that was around the first week of December. The Battle of Bastogne started December 16th, and uh, it was right about that time. After that, we were assigned, assigned the Germans didn't come down the road that night. So, and they took a detour and went some other way, but they didn't come down that particular road, so we were saved. That's why I'm still here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, it was, um, I remember that was the coldest night of my life right up to today. And I was wearing snowpack boots no pack boots here. They're like galoshes, but they got pads in the bottom. And at night you take the pads out and hang them in the dry and you put fresh pads and dry pads. And then still my feet got frozen. And then I was assigned after that to, uh, to chase tanks and trucks that were shot up in battles uh, or, or disabled or broken down. Or, and we did a lot of running around in Bastogne, just repairing vehicles. We, we have a good record. The tent has an excellent record of keeping vehicles repaired, which is important, you know. If a, a vehicle that's broken down, this piece of junk, when you fix it and get it run again, it's, it's a good vehicle. Were you fixing a tank or tracked vehicle at one time and someone shot at you? Yep, yep, that's happened. Can you happened. tell us about that? Yep, yep. It happened twice. And it happened one time in Bastogne when I was working, I was working on a half track and we had a fellow working next to me on a tank and a bullet bounced off the half track right about here. So a sniper took a shot at me. So I went around to work on the other side of the half tank. And I said to Joey, that I looked in the turret, and I said, hey, Joey, there's a sniper shooting at us. Don't come on this side of the vehicle. Stay over there. So I went back to work on the half track, and I hear 
And I looked at the turrets going. I said to Joey, I said, I think it's coming. Shots are coming from that house down there. The house is about a half a mile away. It's coming from that house. There's no place else. It's got to be from that house. So, <laughs> this tank had a 90 millimeter gun on it. And the next thing he took a shot and he blew the house up. <laughs> and I said, holy mackerel, you blew the house up there. There'll be no more shooting from that house, he said. <laughs> I showed you the, uh, we got in the Jeep and drove to the house later on in the day just to see if there was any bodies there. Uh, it was a pretty, pretty well blown up. But there were a lot of pictures floating around all over the place, you know. And I went around picking them up, you know. And I put them in my pocket and I took them with me. And I put them into an album, which I still have. Uh, these are pictures taken from a German house. And it shows German soldiers, you know. Mm -hmm. The second time that I was shot at was we had taken the city of Trier in Germany. Trier was the first major city captured by the Americans. And it was our division that captured it. We were proud of that. Combat Command B of the 10th Armored Division, which I was a part of it. And I was working on a, on a tank there with another fellow. He was underneath the tank chaining a volute spring. I don't know if you know what a volute spring is, but it's, it's a spring. It's not a, a coil. It's a flat piece of steel that's rolled around, you know. It's a, a spring on the bogey assembly of the mm -hmm. tank. And uh, I was just helping him by handing him the tools he needed underneath. I had all the tools in the toolbox over here. And he was on the knee. So he said to me, hey, Charlie, hand me, one, hand me the spanner wrench. And I bent down. As I bent down to pick up the spanner wrench, a bullet bounced right off the tank, right where my head was. Mm. Just, if he hadn't asked me for the wrench, I would have been dead. That's how good that guy was as a shot. So I threw, I threw the spanner wrench at me. I said, so long. I'll see you later. <laughs> and I went. I went to the command post and I reported a sniper. Now we're in the middle of a city and there's all around there's apartment buildings, you know. Well, they sent a patrol out and the patrol found the sniper. It was a 12 year old boy in the top floor of an apartment. He had picked up a rifle from a dead German soldier and he's up in the, this apartment house taking shots at us. So they, uh, they held him for a while, and then they told him that if they found him with another gun, they were going to shoot him, and they let him go. And we never saw him anymore. But uh, that was too close. Two times I come close to getting killed, and one by a kid. Now, you were, uh, you were in Patton's division. Did you, ever see, did you ever see Patton? Yep, I saw him. Two or three or four times. In fact, I even uh, had a talk with him one day, and I took it. I had my camera, and I asked, "Sir, may I take your picture?" And he said, "Certainly." And he stood up, and I took his picture, and I still have it. Hmm. And uh, he was uh, carried two pearl handle revolvers, and uh, you could see him pretty often. He, he, he was always with his jeep running around with the troops there. I was tell him about the time. We were driving a convoy of, of tanks to a staging area. It, it was in France, and uh, on the roads in France, the, uh, the French people would build a wall up to both sides of a road, which would be a road that they may want to block for some reason during the war. And then they would put, on each side, they would put a wagon piled high with rocks. And then what they would do, if they want to block the road, they would wheel the wagon into the opening in the road and then knock the wheels out and drop all the rocks on the road on both sides. And we had a, one of the tanks in our column had a snow cleats on it. 
Now, snow cleats make the track of a tank uh, at least a foot wider than it is. And this fellow came up to the opening in the wall, and he didn't hit it straight. If he hit it straight, he would have went through, but he hit it at an angle, and the tank got stuck there with the snow cleats. And uh, they, one of the sergeants stood out in front of the tank trying to direct him, you know, with his motions to, to back and forth to try to loosen up the tank in the opening and get it through there. When I was standing there watching him see how he was doing with it, you know, and a jeep comes driving up and it has General Patton in it with a driver and the jeep comes right up behind the sergeant. And Patton stands up in the jeep and he leans on the windshield. Now he's only about four or five feet behind this sergeant, but the sergeant hasn't seen him. <laughs> I don't know if I should tell <laughs> Anyway, Patton says to the sergeant, hey sergeant, you're gonna be able to get that tank through there? And the sergeant said, what the, what do you think I'm doing? <laughs> And Patton just sat down again and never said another word. Uh, Did you get the tank through eventually? Oh, yeah. Well, he, he chipped off some of, the, some of the brickwork of the wall and got through. I see. He back and forth and back and forth and broke the bricks off in the wall, you know, and it went through. That reminds me of another, we had another con uh, convoy going through a town in France one day. And... Um, we went through this town, and the streets are very narrow, and we had to make a left turn. And there's buildings, you know, on, the, on a, it's like a T in the road. And uh, so the first tank come, and he tried to make the turn, and there wasn't room. So he got there, now the whole convoy's behind him, and he's, we're stuck in the middle of a town. You can't back this whole convoy. So he goes back. And he goes forward a little bit, and it's the left track just rubs the corner of this building just a little bit, you know. And then he goes back, and it rubs it a little bit more. And back and forth, and finally he got around, and he, he went. Then the next tank come up, and he rubbed it a little bit more. He backed up, and he rubbed it a little bit more. He backed up, and then finally he went. By the time the fifth tank went through, he went, what? <laughs> right, right through the store. <laughs> There was a store there and he went right, uh, drove right through the store. Wow. <laughs> By the fifth time, the first time, <laughs> couldn't make it. I felt sorry for the guy in the store. He was hollering and yelling in French. But we said, hey, we got to get these things through here. <laughs> uh, I should tell you one story about driving in a convoy. We were mechanics and we used to get the vehicles from the ships. They would drive the tanks, trucks, half tracks to where we would set up a big shop area and we would process the vehicles. They, uh, they came with all their equipment in crates. So we had to unpack the crates and store everything where it belongs. And my job was to check the engines. And uh, we set up so many vehicles and then the commander would make a, a convoy and we would drive all these vehicles up to a staging area. And uh, on one of these convoys, we got lost. When, when you ride a, con a convoy, they give you a piece of paper about this wide, as long as it needs to be. And it's one line down the middle of that paper with circles. And in each circle is the name of a town that you're going to go through. That's all, that's, what, that's all the map is. That's the name of each town you're going to go through. So, the commander got lost. He's driving the, the jeep in the front. And we, so we get into this town. It's a town in Germany. And we stop in the middle of the town. And now, this convoy is stretched right out through the town. And it's mostly tanks and half tracks with some trucks in the back to take the drivers back again, you know. And this particular town had a prison camp 
the Germans had a, um, a, a uh, uh, lumber mill, and they were using British prisoners to work the lumber mill. And uh, when we got into the town, the, the German soldiers who were there th thought this was a combat outfit. Didn't know that we, we only had one driver in each vehicle. We couldn't, we couldn't shoot the guns or anything. Well, all we could do was drive them, you know. Scared the hell out of the Germans. And, we, and we're standing in the middle of the town. We can see Germans running out of the back doors of the houses and running into the woods. You know, it's a holy mackerel. We ran to get our guns. You know, said, so what the hell's going on here? And uh, looked down the road ahead of us, and there's a big crowd of, of men there. And they're coming towards us. And we thought it was the German army. We could see German soldiers in the front of this group. So we loaded up our guns and we got ready for, for a firefight, you know. And when the crowd got closer, we saw that they were British. They still had their British uniforms. And they come running, they grabbed us, they put their arms around us, and they were yelling, hey, you freed us, hooray, hooray for the Americans, you know? And uh, we thought, what the hell is going on here? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, they told us that they were in the prison camp, and we freed them. When the Germans saw us coming, they let them go. And the German soldiers that they had walking with them they told us they had treated them very well, and they wanted those soldiers to be treated well. They wanted to make sure that they weren't abused or anything, and uh, they wanted to become prisoners of ours, you know? So, anyway, we started handing them out cigarettes, and they ate them. They were eating the cigarettes. Mm. And we said, holy mackerel, you're not supposed to eat the cigarettes. We haven't had anything to eat for days. So we broke out all our K-rations, and we fed them. And uh, we discovered we had driven 30 miles through the front lines and we were <laughs> in no man's land. Oh, no. So we, we freed about 150 prisoners. We moved the front line up 30 miles. And we took about eight or 10 prisoners without firing a shot. <laughs> And, and this wasn't a, a combat convoy. It was just you no, driving we're delivering. to we're delivering trucks. Delivering. We're delivering tanks that we just processed. What we used to do is take them to a, an area where the, uh, the commanders who, who needed the vehicles were there waiting for them. You know, and they would assign them to the tank crews uh, if they survived, or the new tank crews. And it was called a staging area. And we would drive the vehicles there, get out of them, get in the truck, in the back of a truck, and they would drive us back, you know, to where the shops were. Was, uh... Did your unit receive any commendations for your action there? I don't remember seeing anything for that day, but then, that was a remarkable day. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah, these Germans saw them. They were, you know, they thought we were a combat alpha. If they knew, if those German soldiers running into the woods knew, we were only drivers, you know. But they, they see all these tanks coming down and running. Holy mackerel, you know, they, they took off into the woods. This was in Germany. Uh, what Was the Battle of the Bulge your first combat experience? Um... Yep, that was when I, I first got actively involved in combat. Yep. Before that, I was uh, when you're a, when you're a, a mechanic, you're a service person, so you don't get involved in the combat. But you, you get shot at, you get shelled, and you get bombed. Now we we were did I ever tell you my country slotting? Huh. We were we were this we were in a town in, in Germany called Kaiserslautern, and we were. We had the, uh, the field set up to process tanks and half tracks. And uh, we had uh, processed quite a few tanks and we had them lined up on the edge of the field on one side. 
I was in the middle of the field working on a half track. And uh, on the other side of the field, we had our shop trucks. And I was busy. I had processed this tank. And when they ship the, not the tank, a half track, uh, all the equipment is, is banded down with steel bands in there. And I was busy chipping off the bands to get rid of them because I had taken all the equipment out. And I heard these planes come over. <laughs> well, planes are flying over all the time. I didn't pay any attention to them until I heard the shooting starting. I said, holy mackerel. I looked up and I see these two German planes shooting and dropping bombs. And away they went. And I saw them go out and turn around. And I said, holy mackerel, they're coming back. So I ran to the end of the field where the tanks were, and I dove under one of the tanks. I laid on the ground there, and the planes came back, and they strafed the middle of the field where I was, dropped a bomb or two, and then they went out, and I saw them going out, and I thought, these tanks are ready for combat. So I said, if they come back, I want to be ready. So I got into the turret. And I unlocked the 50 cow and I swung it around. And sure enough, here they come. Now, it's one thing when the plane is going over there and you're shooting at it, you know? No problem. But when you look and he's coming right at you like this, mm-hmm. that's not a good place to be. So I jumped out of the turret. <laughs> I <laughs> slid down the back of the tank and I, on the ground. And I laid there, face down. And they came over shooting up the tanks. And on the other side of the tank where I was, they dropped a bomb there. It bounced me clean up into the air, crushed my chest. My nose and mouth were bleeding. <laughs> and uh, I thought, I said, holy mackerel. I was in bad shape. I couldn't hear anything anymore. There was a lot of fighting going on, but I couldn't hear a thing. And I just laid there on the ground. And I thought, boy, one more pass over here, they're going to kill me. Now. Gosh. Anyway, after they got done shooting at us, I uh, went to the medics to get my my nose and mouth bleeding stopped, you know. And <laughs> I discovered one of the fellows was in one of the shop trucks, and he was drunk, mm-hmm. and he had gone in there to sleep. Mm-hmm. So he's sleeping off his drunk when the planes come over. He heard the noise. He got up, and it was one of the shop trucks that didn't have a door in the back. It had a tailgate that you could fold down. And he walks right off the tailgate, smacks his face right on the ground, and knocks himself out cold. And he lay there through the whole action. So when it was all over, the medics, the medics come on the field, they're picking up the wounded. And they picked him up and took him to the hospital. <laughs> he came back a week later with a purple heart. <laughs> <laughs> Did you get a purple heart? No. I didn't tell anybody that I was banged up. I just went about my business. <laughs> he came back with him. We laughed at like hell at him when he's showing us the purple heart because we knew what happened, you know. Right. But he had the last laugh because a purple heart was five points toward going home at the end of the war. You went home by points, you know. I think you had to, have a, had to have at least 80 points to go home when the war ended. So five more points, you go home sooner. Now you're in the Battle of Bulge, and that was in December of 44, and the war was over in April of 45. Yep. Can you tell us where you went after the Battle of Bulge? You moved into Germany? Oh, yeah. We chased the Germans across Luxembourg right after the Battle of Bastogne. And we got to a town called Rimmick in Luxembourg. And right there is the Saar River. And the Germans all went over the bridge. There was a concrete arch bridge there. And the Germans crossed the bridge. And the last guys to cross the bridge blew up the middle arch so that our troops couldn't go across. Now we got there, we had, we were stuck. So we, uh, we, we took up uh, positions in, in houses, you know, 
and with my section, we took a house right at the edge of the river. And the river, it went, the, the, road, the, the land went down a bank, and then there was a river down here, and, it went across, and then there was a bank on the other side. So that the arch bridge went across to the, to the bank, you know, up here. But the river was really down here. And um, we uh, had the uh, combat engineers come. Now, the opening that was blown up by the Germans and the arch wasn't too wide. It was like maybe about 10 feet. But you just couldn't drive across it. You couldn't jump across it. And the engineers came with a couple of trucks of lumber. I don't know where the hell they got the lumber, but they did. They came with the lumber. And they started to build a section over the, where the bridge was blown out, you know, with wood. And they were doing good. Uh, in a couple of days, they had it almost ready to go. And we were standing there, you know, watching them. And all of a sudden, we look up, and there's a little airplane up there. It's going around and around like this. Just slowly going around. And the next thing you know, the shells are hitting this bridge. And they blew out <laughs> the section where the, the engineers had just built it. They blew it right clean, clean out again. They, that airplane there put them right on the butt. So, the airplane left. The combat, they decided, well, they'll try again. So they started building the bridge again. They get it about halfway done, and the plane came back. Only this time, they had bought a, a uh, half track with an anti-aircraft gun. <laughs> he up there was flying around, and, and they shot him down. Uh -huh. in, in the meantime now, the engineers went down to the river, and they laid a heavy smoke screen there. And they came up with pontoon boats. And they pontoon boated right across the river, which had a good current. And they, they, they anchored it over cables, you know. And they built this pontoon bridge underneath the smoke, where the Germans couldn't see it. The Germans knew what they were doing, but they didn't know where it was. And they kept trying to drop uh, mortar shells through the smoke to hit the bridge. And. Uh, At the same time that they're building this pontoon bridge, both sides started firing artillery shells. And they shelled, the artillery shells went for three days and three nights without stop. I can't imagine where they got all them, them shells. It, it was so bad and so I, I didn't sleep for three days. I was, with all the, you couldn't sleep. And the shells landing all around you, you know. And uh, figure one of them might land where you are. And uh, finally, after three days, it stopped, just like that. And while while the shells were, were were going both ways, you could look up and see them going both directions. You could mm -hmm. you could follow them right through the air, so you see where they're going, where they're going to land. And finally, it stopped. And uh, so, without the shelling going on, we were able to to move around now, so we're driving around the town. There's no civilians there, just us. And we found a factory there that made wine. So another party got started. <laughs> we, went, we went into this factory, and it had thousands of bottles of wine. Just as far back as you can see, it was wine. And they were stacked like up, upside down, you know? in stacks, stacks and stacks. We loaded up the trucks and took the wine, and the party got started. And mm -hmm. man, that party went for about two days there. It was so bad that the company commander issued orders, no more wine drinking, get your drunks off the street. Mm -hmm. Stop drinking the wine. <laughs> what did, when, when was that, Charlie? Do you remember? It was after the Battle of Bastogne. Okay. And, uh, Remick is on the way to uh, is on the way to Metz. I see. And uh, uh, what I'm trying to think of is uh, they finally finished the pontoon bridge, 
and they, they sent a column of tanks across, and they sent the infantry across, and then they told us it was our turn to cross. So, so they said, tomorrow morning you're going to go across. Well, I was only 19 years old then. No, I was 20. And I was, I was still learning how to drive. So the, uh, the sergeant gives me a GMC with a trailer to drive in the convoy. And I'm a little nervous because I hadn't been, I've only been practicing a little bit. I haven't really been doing any a lot of driving at all, you know. And, and now they want to go down this slippery bank and, and across this <laughs> pontoon bridge across the river. And uh, in, the, in the trailer, is all the company barracks bags. <laughs> and I got them all <laughs> behind my truck. Now the so, barracks bags are bags with personal items from the troops? Duffel, they're duffel bags, yeah. Mm -hmm. They had a strap on them, you know, and no idea about that. But, and, uh, so I was slipping, sliding down the bank. And uh, what happened then was the our artillery moved up to the edge of the river, right up to the edge. And the German artillery moved up on the other side. And they're shooting at each other. And they're telling us, OK, cross the bridge. <laughs> huh. And you can see the red flashes. Even through the smoke, you can see the red flashes of the guns going, you know. You know, hey, one, one shot, and then the pontoon bridge goes down the river, and you're going to go down with it. <laughs> but I. I drove across, and I drove quite a bit that day, I remember, and after that I was an expert driver. Charlie, can you tell us uh, when you entered Germany? Do you recall when that was? That was a tree year. Okay. Tree year away. I don't remember if conscious lot was before that or after that. I think it, it was after, I think, the conscious lot. Uh, it's hard. Uh, I rarely knew where I was because you don't know. You're busy with uh, what you're doing and you're not looking for street signs or, or town signs. You just, you, uh, you just do your job and uh, just, it's up to the sergeant to keep track of where you are. And you just do your job. And, uh, it was... Uh, it was an exciting time. It sounds like it was. You were um, you got out of the service in 1946, and you were in Germany in 1945. Were you in the occupation forces? Yes. Uh, when uh, the war ended, I didn't have enough points to go home immediately. So I, I was assigned to the 9th Infantry Division. And uh, they took myself and two other mechanics. And they put us at an intersection that's halfway between Munich and Nuremberg on the highway. They gave us a pyramidal tent, stacks of cans of gasoline, cases of oil, antifreeze. And we ran an army uh, service station right on the highway. We lived in the tent. They brought us rations and stuff. And uh, off to one side was a large open field. And... Uh, Every morning, they dropped off 12 German PWs who were, uh, who were mechanics. And what we did was, uh, when trucks were brought in that were being retired, we had them take the trucks apart and put the engines here, put the wheels there, put the transmissions there, you know. And so if some outfit needed a part of a truck, they would come to see us and uh, we'd take them. It was an army junkyard. They, we called it a boneyard, but that's what it was. We, ran a, we were in a junkyard. And the, uh, the German soldiers were very, very friendly. They, they were happy to come here with us and uh, take them trucks apart. And we uh, would feed them K-rations. In fact, they used to fight to get on the truck in the morning, you know, to, to come to see us, to be with us. Was there any animosity between the American troops and the, the German troops after the war? None that I saw. I, uh, 
we, we've captured a few, a few prisoners and we all, always interrogated them. We had a fellow in our outfit who spoke German. And uh, many times we asked them, why are you fighting this war? And their answer was, for the same reason you were fighting the war. They gave us a gun and they sent us over here. <laughs> That's why we, we want to be home with our families. So I think I told you about one fellow that we were interrogating and he spoke English. And he spoke English with a Brooklyn accent. So we said, well, where the hell are you from? He says, I'm from Brooklyn. Hmm. You're from Brooklyn. How the hell did you get into the German army? He said, well, I was born in Germany. And when I was a little boy, my family moved to Brooklyn, New York, where I was raised. When I was 18, we went to visit my family in the Germany, in the town where I was born. And because I was born there, they drafted me. So he's in the German army, you know, and we captured him. So uh, we had captured him with a few other prisoners, and we were told to, to take them to the MPs. So on the, way, on the way to the MPs, we were talking with this kid. He's only about 20, 20 years old, 21 years old. And he says, hey, he says, why don't you let me stay with you guys? He says, I can be a lot of help to you, you know? He says, I speak German, I know, I know my way around. He says, uh, uh, and we thought, he's, he's about as American as we were. So we dropped the other prisoners off at the MPs. We took him back with us. And we took his uniform and got rid of it, and we gave him a GI outfit. And he stayed with us to the rest of the war, for the rest of the war. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he, he interpreted for us. Uh, and they, when we had to go somewhere, he told us how to get there. And uh, it was a riot. We had <laughs> German soldiers. <laughs> and none of the officers knew it, you know. <laughs> Cause he talked, he was Brooklyn, he talked Brooklyn. If you talk about him, he talked Brooklyn. And, but the, he got into trouble when the war ended because he, he, he picked up a motorcycle somewhere along the way. At the end of the war, he was running down the autobahn with his motorcycle, and the MP stopped him. And they said, where'd you get the motorcycle? He said, I bought it. And he did. He bought it. He actually bought the motorcycle from a German dealer. And uh, they said, nah, you didn't buy that motorcycle. Turned it into the motor pool. He said, I will like hell. They said, what do you mean, you will like hell? You turn that motorcycle into the motor pool. And he said, I'm not going to turn it. It's my motorcycle. So they said, what offer you, are you with? <laughs> and that, that was it. <laughs> he couldn't tell them what a, he couldn't tell them what offer it was because he wasn't with any outfit. So they, they took him to a POW camp. And um, we tried our best to get him out of there. We wrote letters to the high command telling them that he had, what he had done during the war and how he, helped us and all that. And they said, no, he's a German prisoner. We can't let him go. <laughs> but I learned shortly before I came home that he had been allowed to join, join the American army. Really? At a time when they were letting, letting people go, they took him in. And I guess they gave him a special job as an interpreter or something, you know. And uh, that's why they kept him. I see. Can you tell us where you were when you heard that the war had ended? I was at Garmisch Partenkirchen, a really good place to be when the war ends. Garmisch is a, uh, is a resort area for uh, uh, the German civilians. And it's a place where I think it was the 1936 Olympics were held. You know? And uh, there was a big hotel they're called uh, Lake Ipsy, and the 10th Armored Division took it over. And that's where we were when the war ended. Actually, we were poised at the north end of the Brenner Pass. We were waiting for orders to go through the pass, uh, because we were going to join up with the troops in, in uh, Italy. But the war ended, and we were held up there. And we took over this uh, resort. And we had a ball there. There were a lot of young women that were working there. 
And uh, I, I had a girlfriend till the uh, time I had to, to ship home. And you mentioned points earlier. Could you tell us about points and when you came back to the States? I came, I came home. I was discharged on March 8th, 1946. And um, I guess I came home around March 5th, or across on March 5th. That's about it. How many points did you need, and what, what, were, what were points based on? Uh, points were based on the months of service uh, that you were overseas, what, what combat you were in, and what, uh, what awards you had, what medals, you know. And uh, each one was worth so many points, and you added up what you had, and that's how, that's how you got your points. When the war was over, you came back by boat? On a liberty ship. And that was an ex interesting experience because we had a big storm coming across, and that ship did everything but turn upside down in the water, I'll tell you. It was, uh, for three days, they sealed the ship up, and that was good for a while, you know, and, uh, and then, then it started to smell bad, you know. So I tried to find a place to get, to get out and get some air, and I, I found a stairway that went up, and it came out on, above the bridge. And they had, it's the only hatchway that was open, but it was laced with a canvas. So I enlisted the canvas so I could step out and get some air. And when I stepped out, I was facing front of the ship. And as I watched it, it went down and down, yeah. and it went under the water, down and down, and the water came up to where I was and hit me. <laughs> the whole ship was underwater. Hmm. The bridge and everything, believe it or not. I, I tell people this, people don't believe me that the bridge was underwater. The bridge was underwater. Of course, it came up to where I was and, and knocked me back. It felt like I got hit with rocks. I got back into that, <laughs> to that hatchway and I laced it up again. Hmm. But uh, I had to get out some air because everybody below deck was throwing up, you know, and it gets to smell bad after a while. Did you land in uh, New York? New York and uh, watch the Statue of Liberty go by, I remember that. I didn't get emotional until I saw the Statue of Liberty go by. I realized what I had been through and now I'm back home and safe again. And you were discharged in New York, and what did you do after, after you left uh, the service? <laughs> well, I, I was working at, in a, a, a signal repair shop at North White Plains for the New York Metro Railroad when I went into the service. And because uh, my name was on a, uh, a seniority roster, I was able to come back and bumped the guy out of the job who was holding my job while I was away. Oh. He, he had my job and uh, he made good money. He actually made them good money because they worked a lot of overtime. And, but when I came home, I bumped him and, and uh, took over my job as an as a assistant mechanic at uh, North White Plains, New York. Then I became a mechanic, and I went up the ladder. I uh, became, uh, I went into the engineering office. I did the engineering signal design. A lot of signals on the old New York Central that I designed that are working oh, yeah. right to today. And I got to be supervisor, took over division. I had about 100 men working for me. and. Uh, for a while I had an office in Grand Central Terminal. And then for a while I had an office in Back Bay Station in, 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 uh, in Boston. Hmm. Are there any other memories you'd like to share with us about uh, your service?
No, I guess I covered it pretty good. Eh? Do you recall any of the folks that you served with? Do you still keep in touch with them? or? Well, in basic training, one day uh, the first sergeant came up to me and he said, what are you doing here? You're on KP today. I said, no, I was on KP yesterday. He said, you're on KP today. He said, get over to the mess hall. So I said, okay, I ran over to the mess hall. I reported to the mess hall sergeant and I said, the sergeant sent me over and said, I'm on KP today. What's your name? Lombardi. Went to the, no, you're not on KP today. Get out of here. So I ran back. And I said, I just saw the mess sergeant. He said, I'm not on KP today. He said, listen, Pandatello, I was reading the I said, Pandatello, who the hell's Pandatello? I'm not Pandatello. He says, you're not Pandatello? What's your name? Lombardi. You're not Pandatello? I said, holy mackerel. He said, okay. He said, I thought, Jesus Christ, you were Pandatello. So I thought to myself, I've got to find Pandatello. Oh. So I ran through the barracks. He was in another barracks, this fellow. I looked at it, it was like looking in the mirror. Mm. Joseph Panatello. I said, my name is Charlie Lombardi, and you and I are in KP together. <laughs> so we got together, and uh, we hung out while we were in basic training, became very good friends. He gave me his sister's address, and I wrote letters to her. Mm. I gave him my sister's address, and he wrote letters to her during the war. When the war ended, I knew he lived in Mount Vernon, which is right north of the Bronx where I live. So when the war ended, I looked him up. And I said, hi, Joe, let's get together, you know? What the hell? We only live a short distance apart. So we started dating girls together, you know? And um, one Saturday night, he didn't have a date. And I did, so I said, I I'll bring you a girl. So I brought my sister. And he started dating my sister, married her. He's my brother-in-law. Hmm. Hmm. He lives in Long Island, though, and I live up here. That's a wonderful story. Yep. Yeah. Well, Charlie, I'd like to thank you for your service and for You're sharing welcome. your time with us today. Hmm.